Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the sixth uh, webinar in the FEPRIN series uh, addressing ethical issues emerging uh, in the COVID pandemic. Uh, today's webinar focuses on publication ethics and it's titled An Epidemic of Research, Publication Ethics During a Public Health Emergency. As we've noted that the urgency and nature of the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in health research being undertaken at an unprecedented scale and published at a, at a, at a rate that's been uh, unforeseen uh, in the past. So this has been accompanied by a race to disseminate, share and publish data and findings, which in turn has led to retractions, questions about peer review and pre-publication peer review uh, via Twitter. So there's a large number of questions that emerge about the status of uh, publication of academic science about rigor uh, in the context of COVID-19. And we couldn't be happier as FEPRIN to have two absolute experts to help us with this issue today. So our, today, our speakers today are uh, Professor Ezekiel Emanuel, who's the Vice Provost of Global Initiatives, uh, professor, professor and Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Lara Golubly, Editor of the Bulletin of World Health Organization and a member of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. So the process process for today will be to have uh, first Professor Emanuel speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll have Lara Golagli speak and then we'll open up for discussion. So I'm very much looking forward to this. It's a very topical and important issue and without further ado I'm going to hand it over to Professor Emanuel. And thanks to both for uh, agreeing to speak and thanks to everybody for attending today. Over Thank to you Ezekiel. Ross. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would like to uh, begin from uh, foundations, which is how uh, bioethicists tend to start their process. Um, the first thing I would say is we need to think about why we have publication in the first place. Um, and the main reason is to share our findings with other people around the world uh, uh, and to improve, therefore, our knowledge base. And in improving our knowledge base, improve human health and human well being more generally. Um, that is the purpose that we have. The mechanisms that we have to do that are mainly our journals, um, or traditionally, for historical reasons, they have been our journals. And we've had editors to ferret out uh, problems, uh, inadequacies, poor communication in a variety of ways to try to elevate the communication process. That mechanism, we all have to acknowledge, is not perfect. It's going to make mistakes on occasion. Uh, it's going to publish things which turn out not to be true. Uh, but part of the publication process is to ferret out uh, differences. Over the last few decades, we've had a number of problems with this. We've had a lot of research identifying inadequate research. But COVID has certainly strained the system. Uh, there are many uh, problems we could identify. I will identify uh, two uh, and try to think through something about them and then make some modest recommendations about how we might proceed. The first problem was alluded to by Ross, which is uh, the rapid publication uh, with inadequate peer review that has led to rapid retractions and mistakes. Uh, and I think uh, as distressing as anything, it's happened at uh, some of the most prominent biomedical journals. Um, we've had retractions where the senior editors have acknowledged they actually didn't see the data that they were publishing uh, or collect the data that they were publishing or participating in a thorough review of the data that they were publishing. Uh, and at least some of it appeared uh, thoughtless. Um, and we've had other problems with this. We've also had uh, related, a second related problem of not sharing the underlying data so that they can be uh, verified and keeping that data. Uh, the ethics of that are, I think, uh, we're still in an evolution uh, on that. Uh, and then the third problem, uh, maybe I said I, two, I meant three. The third problem I would say is uh, what Ross called pre-publication 
release of data. We've had a number of cases. Uh, I don't know if the most recent, but certainly one that has uh, rankled a lot of people was the release of uh, uh, the dexamethasone study out of Britain in a press release uh, that was not, there was no manuscript that underlying data were not shared. Uh, and it was very hard to make an evaluation. Uh, claims, substantive claims were made. The dexamethasone case is not the only one. We've had a number of these uh, uh, science by press release uh, episodes. Um, why are we worried? Well, the retraction uh, is uh, obvious that we're publishing data, which is false. We send the entire field down uh, paths that uh, turn out not to be true. It's a waste of substantive energy and intellectual uh, timing, uh, shapes the public opinion incorrectly. That may be very difficult to wind back. Um, uh, obviously, uh, that is a problem. Uh, you may not have any uh, fabrication uh, or falsification um, or plagiarism Nonetheless, publishing bad data uh, that has to be retracted very, very quickly is a major problem. Uh, we have all witnessed the kind of consequences that can happen from the Lancet uh, autism study that has uh, been so egregious and yet so difficult to get out of the public mind. What's the problem with uh, publication uh, of, res or uh, press release publication of data? Well. No one has a chance to evaluate it. And even afterwards, there's no chance of evaluating it. It is simply taken on faith. And one of the things that science has always stood against is taking things on faith. Uh, it's stood on the basis of put out the data, let the best minds look at it, let the best minds try to repeat it if it's that important. Um, and let's see how it fits in to the uh, puzzle that we are creating to get a whole and complete picture of how nature works. Um, if we don't have underlying data, if we simply are taking a scientist uh, a position uh, on faith without being able to evaluate it, uh, we cannot actually make any uh, progress. We can't see how it fits in. We don't understand the hesitations of this. And then again, the public can become fixated and it can be very difficult to undo them. In this case of dexamethasone, you might cha be changing practices worldwide. The care in the lives of thousands, tens of thousands of patients may be uh, at stake uh, in terms of changing how they are treated. Uh, and that may be uh, very uh, uh, problematic for them. Uh, so we have compromising the scientific uh, understandings we have of the world, the way we understand uh, what is true. Uh, and then we also have, uh, as quite clear from uh, the dexamethasone study, uh, the potential to uh, very much uh, threaten and undermine and maybe even uh, lead to uh, serious adverse events, even death of patients uh, if it changes practice and that change uh, turns out to be wrong. Now, normally, uh, as I mentioned, we have a, a process <laughs> that we hope, uh, it's a threefold process as uh, I think of it, uh, that we hope will uh, minimize the chance that these problems will occur. Um, and we cannot eliminate the problems, I think. Uh, I think we can minimize them. One is you have editorial review. The second is you have a peer review process whereby educated people uh, uh, look at the data, try to evaluate the entire paper, evaluate the claims made based upon the data. And finally, you have the wider medical, biomedical community. Uh, once a paper is published that seeks to evaluate, maybe reproduce uh, and put uh, the new findings in a context by which we can evaluate their importance as well as their veracity. Um, clearly, uh, retractions uh, are a problem. Uh, it's a failure of the first two pro processes, the editorial evaluation and the peer review process. And uh, the uh, uh, 
publication by press release uh, just bypasses the whole system. Uh, there's no potential really to evaluate it until we end up with a paper. Um, these are serious and egregious errors. They are somewhat understandable in the sense that we, especially with a pandemic that threatens the lives of uh, millions of people, uh, we want to get out information rapidly so that we can uh, shape and respond appropriately and hopefully reduce all the adverse consequences of a pandemic. Uh, we've got to balance the rapid release with the aspiration for truth. Um, and I think that we have uh, misdone the balance. Where do the faults lie? Well, they obviously, to some degree, lie with researchers uh, who have not done an adequate job in an attempt to rush out their results. Um, sometimes that rush is for good reason. Again, trying to advance the field, trying to save lives. Sometimes that rush may not be for uh, pristine motives, but for vanity, uh, prestige, uh, and all the other things we associate with being first uh, in these responses. Uh, they certainly motivated the Chinese to withhold their data and not uh, share uh, them. Uh, they have clearly motivated people in getting uh, less than uh, uh, results that were not fully vetted and they did not participate in collecting. Um, the uh, press release results, I think that there are two groups to main, well, there are three groups, obviously the scientists, again, that have sought to go to press release without providing any data. There are clearly the non-biomedical journals, the public media that we call social media, uh, they want headlines. They have their own imperatives to get news out, to get attention for their own uh, publication. Uh, they very much like these kind of results because they allow them to keep, uh, as we say, eyeballs looking at their websites and, and their journals. Um, uh, and then we uh, also have our own journal editors. Um, so they could change the publication process. And uh, I think adopt, go back to their original ideas about publication, um, that press releases would undermine the possibility of publishing major results in peer reviewed journals. How can we remedy this problem? Um, I can think of uh, two, I think, important uh, steps. Uh, one important step is to clearly identify uh, the kind of peer review, the quality of the peer review, the thoroughness of the peer review that any particular article has undergone. Uh, it's quite clear that rapidly trying to publish something uh, does not get you the same kind of peer review that a more thorough consideration might get um, and a back and forth with the author might get. Again, I have said rapidity is understandable but we should clearly identify articles uh, that have not gotten a thorough uh, editorial and peer review that have been rushed uh, and short-circuited that process. Um, I can imagine we could have three levels of uh, signification or signage or uh, alerts to the reader. One is there was an editorial review but no peer review. One is there was a rapid peer review that was, didn't meet the normal peer review standards. And then we have a complete peer review uh, of the uh, article. It seems to me that's an important identification to people. Uh, it does, again, peer review is not perfect. I'm a critic of uh, peer review in many ways, but I do think it uh, provides, again, an attempt to reduce the risk of any problems with the publication. It does not eliminate them, but it reduces the risk. So I think uh, introducing a new grading system on peer review would be a positive impact uh, and change how people review uh, the data. I think a second thing is um, that we need to go back to an old system, uh, which I thought we had, uh, which was you know, you do a press release about your publication that is unrelated to a scientific conference. You are not going 
to a major meeting and presenting your data as an abstract or a meeting uh, um, paper. You are simply holding a press release for the wider general press ahead of publication in the biomedical literature, therefore ahead of the uh, editorial review and the peer review process. That paper cannot be published uh, in a biomedical journal, that the leading biomedical journals will refuse to publish that paper if it has been uh, sub or disseminated without going through the peer review process. It seems to me we need to stick to that. Uh, and we would get scientists and researchers having to make a choice. They either do a press release and try to get their moment of fame ahead of publication, or they wait uh, a few weeks. Uh, and in the case of COVID, it does appear to be uh, uh, just a few weeks to get a editorial review, a rapid peer review and publication. It seems to me, uh, yes, there could be a risk to the knowledge that we're gaining and to some people, most importantly, if say the dexamethasone study turns out to be true and practice is not about for two or three weeks. Um, that does seem worth it to me. And it does seem, it is a trade-off and we shouldn't be, shouldn't ignore the trade-off. On the other hand, one of the reasons to go back to, and this will be my concluding comment, the reason we have a trade-off is because there are downsides by uh, publication by press release in terms of false information, incomplete information, uh, and false conclusions and false change practices if that becomes the norm. Uh, I fear that we go to snake oil kind of publication uh, much too frequently um, that way and that a couple of weeks uh, delay so that we can have a rapid review uh, is worth it. And I think the responsibility for doing that is based upon the collective action of the leading, the editors of the leading journals. And I hope that they reassert their principle uh, about uh, not publishing something unless it has, uh, 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 if it has been released to the wider public ahead of the editorial review and the peer review process. So with that, I'm going to pause and let Lara talk and look forward to the comments and the uh, discussion. Hello, everyone. Uh, Ross, can you just let me know that you can actually hear me? Very good, thank you. Thanks. Well, Professor Emmanuel has opened up a very nice um, chain of discussion there, but I just wanted to back up a little bit and remind everyone of sort of how we got here, because um, we've had past calls for more accessible data, which have led to expectations of faster almost instant public availability of results. Um, I'd like us to recognize some of the shortfalls and unattended consequences of these changes to the scientific publication exercise and suggest perhaps a couple more things to consider for course correction, if not in time for this response, hopefully for the next. So for those of you who haven't been following epidemic responses until this year, it's a constant struggle. WHO is responding at any one time to more than a dozen health emergencies, including cholera, polio, yellow fever, measles, monkeypox, plague. And four years ago, when the Ebola epidemic in Western Africa was just winding down and Zika starting up in Brazil, many people had had enough, finally, of the very slow accretion of knowledge on these viruses both of which had been known to infect humans for decades, but for which the world 
is really horribly unprepared to treat and seemingly incapable of preventing. And this map just shows you what we published at the start of the Zika epidemic, which is the history of the outbreaks as they have gone across the globe in the different years that those have occurred. And the fact that we really were really not ready to deal with an outbreak in um, Southern and Latin America at the time that it came. So in 2016, this push to share the data publicly and get the results, however preliminary they are, out for examination, resulted in the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors changing its recommendation on precedence. And it wasn't focused on press releases per se, although we could argue maybe that needs to be done now, but on uh, preprints so that henceforth in a public health emergency of international concern, authors would not be penalized for making their work public prior to submission uh, to one of the established journals. I don't seem to be able to move these slides. There we go. So these were the three main papers um, that went into that consideration from the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. And I have to say, I think relatively few people even noticed this change at the time that it occurred. And if we look at the raw counts of the PubMed entries for Zika, so 75 years of knowing Zika, uh, we have about 13,000 papers altogether. And for Ebola, we have 40, 45 years of Ebola epidemics. We have about 25,000 papers. And now we have about 25,000 papers on COVID in the first six months. So we've really um, changed the rate at which this is happening. And here's two different uh, graphs showing that unfortunately we haven't reached the peak of the FE curve on the publications yet. The first graph just shows you research papers and the second graph is all COVID papers um, combined. So there's a lot of reviews and editorials and viewpoints mixed in there as well. But uh, we are hoping for that curve to flatten one of these days. So there's nothing wrong with a high volume per se, but this job of separating the wheat from the chaff actually clogs up the machine when it is beyond what the peer review system can handle. So the best journals in the world are finding it increasingly difficult to compete for the time of the experts in the fields to adequately review the papers. And then the retractions start coming. Um, some papers have simply disappeared from the preprint servers and Retraction Watch is luckily keeping track of these for us. Um, others have been formally retracted from high ranking journals and those editors find themselves in the situation of having to explain why such influential articles need to be so rapidly uh, withdrawn. And this is the rest of the Retraction Watch list. In trying to balance accuracy, um, relevance, transparency, and speed, miscalculations are inevitable. Science has always advanced in fits and starts. However, we now have a situation where everyone is affected at the same time, and further disruptions in the balance of public trust is potentially disastrous. Ethics for editors means being constantly critical and constantly open to refutations of received ideas, to the explorations of new ones. Editors need to treat what they receive with impartiality and be able to recognize the gaps, the fallacies, the limitations, the caveats, and the thinking from the last war. So from a public health perspective, the last war was Ebola, it was influenza, it was SARS, anything we consider to have overcome and are therefore, and we therefore feel qualified to extrapolate from these experiences. So the biggest service we can do for our readers is to acknowledge the limitations and present uncertainty. With no printing press to run, preprints is a misnomer. Most are not pre anything, they're very close to their final appearance. Sort of research sketches would be a more accurate term. The reason that journals continue to want to apply some sort of quality filter can be really hard to articulate from an economic perspective, 
particularly when most authors pay a sizable fee now for each paper to be published. But there's definitely an ethical reason that hasty, poorly designed and shaky studies should be walled off from the people who want to base policy on them. The engineer really needs to stand under the bridge. So speaking in the context of another disruption of how we handle information, Clay Shirky noted that we're not moving from one engineered system to another engineered system simply with different characteristics. We're moving from an evolved system, one in which very few people have access to, the curiosity for, or the ability to comment on raw data and preliminary analyses, to an engineered system of radical exposure to the inner workings of the scientific process. It's hardly surprising that there have been some bumps. We've pushed formal and explicit statements about uncertainty into many people's lives for the first time. Only last year, in December, <laughs> the principal guarantor of scientific authority wasn't law or regulation, and it wasn't hardware or software. It was inconvenience. It was a hassle to figure out how it all worked. And when we feel ourselves getting overwhelmed with information, instead of asking what's gone wrong with the information flows, Shirky suggests that we discipline ourselves to ask, which filter just broke? What were we relying on before that stopped functioning? When we start asking these questions, we may get some clues as to where we need to put the design effort. And the design brief needed for ethical scientific publishing uh, in public health emergencies needs to account for the difficulties faced by the major actors of this system, the patients, their families, healthcare workers, but also policymakers and systematic reviewers. If we analyze their situation through the concept of filter failure, positing that instead of too much information, the the problem is that the traditional means of managing and evaluating information are ill-suited to the realities of a pandemic response. Some of the major consequences of filter failure are inadequate information retrieval systems for point of care settings, the problem of identifying all relevant information in a vast landscape of information resources, a lack of health literacy and complete loss of public trust in science just at the time we need it most. However, new filters can be designed and these may include improved ways to adapt the reporting of research to people's needs, better information systems and more attention to health literacy. So in conclusion, and I completely agree with the need to rely on the old systems of peer review in addition, but while the marginal material cost of producing more studies is negligible from the publisher's perspective. The intangible costs in terms of attention, care, concentration and focus are substantial. And I put to you that the ethical task of the publisher is to balance both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Golagli and Professor Emanuel for very stimulating presentations that I think nicely set up uh, the discussion to come. I'm wondering, Professor Emanuel, if you had any uh, comments that you would want to make to uh, Dr. Golagli and vice versa? Or should we just go directly to the... Uh, oh, uh, I think Dr. Professor Emanuel is on mute. Oh. There you go. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Uh, Lara, I totally agree with your claim that the filter process needs attention and we need to figure it out. And one of the worries is a sort of uh, being overwhelmed by the amount of data. No one, I don't care who you are, can read 3,000 articles adequately in six months um, and uh, come to any conclusions, much less the public. That's why we've always relied on top flight journals to help us with that, both in terms of publishing things and then in terms of doing reviews that give us a summation with the proper uh, um, caveats, as it were, in that. So I'm not sure whether you agree with the idea of, of the, the two ideas I suggested. Um, and I would 
just ask you, how, how do you view grading peer review uh, so that some people, maybe we have more confidence in a thorough peer review than a non-peer reviewed situation. And also uh, ba basically going back to the old system of, you know, you're doing, a PR, you're doing a press release, we're not publishing. Um, it seems to me that would control at least the press release part of it um, or require a press release with complete data that you would basically get in, you know, tables one and two of a, of a paper in your journal. Well, thank you for the question. I think um, grading peer review is already happening. So preprints equate to zero peer review or peer review that happens post hoc and in public. And with the um, progressive uh, sort of ranking of the journals, that's a proxy usually for the quality of peer review. So asking those journals to then make a comparable statement about what peer review actually happened, uh, I think would be problematic. Of course, journals that have chosen open peer review, such as the BMJ, just open it all up and the reader can then judge for themselves on how comprehensive they feel the peer review process was. So possibly journals should be graded higher if they can maintain, particularly in these circumstances, an open peer review system. And then the second question on press releases, the press release is what generated the Wakefield um, debacle and uh, the paper was already published. So I don't think it's the primacy of the press release over the paper that's the problem. I think it's how do we deal honestly with the media? And in fact, I didn't somehow get my last slide, but the last slide is from the COVID Research Coalition that asks people, it's a call for action to researchers to journal editors, to funders of research, and to people who speak to the media to um, be more balanced and honest about what they actually have to say. Great, thank you. So we're getting a series of questions around uh, med archive and preprints and how to manage that. So there's one sort of sort of picking up on on, on your point and another point made by one of the commentators in the chat, well, let the community do the peer review like they do in other scientific disciplines. Um, but how then do you manage issues that relate to standards of clinical care that may have uh, issues related to liability, uh, for example, and I like the, uh, the issue around, uh, let's change the standard of care by using um, dexamethasone uh, without anybody ever seeing uh, a paper that indicates that it probably should rise to the level of a standard of care. How would you manage to, as, so as somebody from both the journal editor and from uh, your perspective, Professor Emanuel, what do we do with this new move towards these open archives? Who would like to pick that up first? Um, I can start. I think that, again, it's this confounding of two problems. One is volume. The second is, is uh, reliability. And the problem that we currently have is we have working mechanisms for liability that can't currently cope with the volume. And so if we decide as a scientific community that our evidence ecosystem needs all eyes on it at all times, that's absolutely fine. We need to change the incentives away around the way research is funded and the way that precedence is somehow desirable to do that. Um, but yes, it's quite an utopian view. Why not? Absolutely. Professor Emanuel. Well, um, so where did preprint come from and where does it, why does it exist in other fields? And I think hitherto has been less prominent in biomedical journals. Um, I'm not familiar with all the other areas, and I'm certainly not as familiar as Lara is with this, but I am familiar with some of them. And typically, the reason we have a preprint culture is the long delay between submitting a paper and its publication. In many fields, that can be years. Uh, certainly in uh, economics, I know that they, uh, the peer review process is glacial. Uh, and the consequences, people didn't want to sit on the data. Uh, graduate students needed to get their ideas out there to get jobs. And so you ended up with this peer, re this uh, preprint process where it's thrown up there uh, and everyone responds. Uh, I think 
uh, largely the biomedical literature has avoided that by having uh, rapid uh, peer review, uh, but still thorough. And, you know, all of us who do peer review for the leading journals, we get, you know, you've got three weeks or you've got two weeks to get this done. And it does seem onerous when you're a reviewer, but boy, do you love it when you're an author uh, because you get a decision and uh, it's not, you're not waiting years. Uh, that is totally unnecessary. Um, it also has led, I think, in, in the biomedical field to relatively short publication, so you don't have to do this literally encyclopedic 100-page article uh, to get a, a major finding and a major set of uh, ideas and conclusions out there. Um, and I think the, you know, I don't know, Laura, maybe you will inform us, but, you know, we have seen now that uh, we can go from submission to comprehensive peer review, to revision, to publication in a matter of a few weeks, single digit weeks. And that does seem to me to be important. Uh, and I think even in a pandemic, uh, because of the risk of making mistakes and harming people, literally people's lives at stake, uh, uh, I think we should put an emphasis on reliability here over more rapidity. Um, I think a few we a single a number of single digit weeks to get a, a pretty good peer review um, and get it out there on the web is worth uh, that improving the right reliability that way is worth the time um, and I actually I am not a big fan of the peer of the preprint uh, culture I think the preprint culture is really a consequence of delay and since we have shrunk the delay in the biomedical world substantially, uh, I prefer the old style here. And I think uh, its value in increasing reliability is definitely worth it. Um, I think it, it's a not necessarily productive use of time to throw thousands of papers out there and let the community, quote unquote, fish for that, uh, do the peer review, because I think that uh, diverts uh, substantive energy um, and again may uh, enhances confusion great thanks so I have a question about I think it probably uh, relates to the culture of science so how do you uh, set up situations or systems so that scientists don't feel pressured by the uh, PR mechanisms of their institutions so we know that universities research institutes uh, rely upon getting the word out about the excellent work that's being done under the auspices of their institutions. That leads to uh, spin-off benefits in terms of advancement, uh, everybody. So how, how do we engage uh, in this phenomenon? Um, uh, sticks and carrots, essentially. So sanctions somehow for the institutions that promote uh, or that require such mediatization of results uh, prior to finalization. And we could have um, some imaginative ideas about what those sanctions would look like, including um, moratoria on publishing in the major journals for a certain amount of time, uh, withdrawal of research funding, downgrading in research assessment exercises, etc. And then um, the reward system on the same by the same token, uh, for those who conduct ethical research, including grading of universities, funders, researchers, etc. Uh, and we could, I mean, I think the field has had now more public scrutiny and exposure as ever. We need to increase our game with how really excellent researchers are recognized. Why do we have such fabulous ceremonies for people who essentially memorize text um, and put it in front of a screen and yet nobody's ever seen or could name, nobody who's not in the field could name a viral, virologist. So I think we need to do something about the public recognition of the people behind the scenes that are advancing this knowledge that impacts on everyone's life. Thank you. Professor Emanuel? Uh, yeah, I do think that the, the responsibility here, institutions are going to do institution things, which is, you know, self promote their interests. And I don't think uh, it's foolhardy for us to say, well, they should abide uh, by these rules. And I think Lara's right. 
uh, I'm not so, I, I, I have less faith in this regard in uh, carrots and more faith in sticks. And I think uh, Lara suggested the two sticks. I, I would emphasize them uh, and look, editors have to stick to the line and they have to stick to it. And I agree with this collectively. They can't do it individually. You can't have one journal say, we're gonna to stick to the line. You do a press release and we're not publishing you if the next journal uh, equally prestigious is gonna do it. So they have to, and I, you know, I think this is for the, you know, the, uh, all the international journal editors of the leading journals to agree about uh, press release uh, science. And uh, I think they need to stick to it. You're not gonna publish. And if we find that the institution has been encouraging it, we're gonna have a moratorium. I like that idea. Uh, you know, it, uh, if it's the institution driving it, then the institution should suffer. Uh, uh, and we should be able to reduce their pressure on scientists to do uh, public relations uh, uh, releases. Um, and I think similarly, Laura suggested, and I think this is true, uh, funding agencies have to be more uh, vigilant about this, uh, whether it's foundations or the traditional governmental funding agencies, that if you do a press release ahead of a publication, we're not going to recognize it, and we're not going to view that as a dissemination technique. I think these working together, you won't get the, the prestige of the, pub, of the, uh, of the uh, paper, uh, and you know, you're going to endanger your funding, uh, and subsequent funding, and there ought to be a, you know, some kind of conjoint list about us, uh, like the, uh, in the United States, we have it, the uh, 10 most wanted criminals, you know, the, uh, the people who violate this. And I do think uh, that collective punishment has been something that we've used in plagiarism, fabrication, falsification of data. And I think uh, we have to make that punishment severe. Uh, Short-circuiting this process is, uh, you know, I, I'd be surprised if anyone can find a uh, set of situations, you know, any single case you might be able to find, but as a practice, and what we're talking about is inculcating practices, that it's actually enhanced the science uh, over time rather than undermine the science over time. We have this editorial process for a reason, and it is a good reason which is it serves a, uh, a function of, as Laura said, separating out junk or questionable stuff from uh, stuff which we think we have a higher index of uh, belief in. And I think that's immensely uh, beneficial to the whole world and to progress and to patients' health, frankly. Great, thanks. So another emerging uh, actor in the information ecosystem that we haven't discussed yet is of course the influential medium of social media, Twitter. Uh, what sort of things, uh, thoughts do you have about uh, managing that unruly beast which has become the most rapid means of disseminating anything in a almost blunt assertion manner? Any thoughts about uh, obligations and responsibilities of scientists, journals, institutions, with respect to their Twitter presence? Um, yeah. <laughs> go, you want to go, go ahead, ahead Professor Manuel? Or Lara, go no, ahead. it's very <laughs> quick. I just say ignore it and it'll go away. <laughs> like okay. it, will, it, it will not go away, but I do agree with the ignore it. So I, I will fess up right away. I've just joined Twitter and the reason I joined Twitter is not because I wanted to, but because someone was impersonating me and the easiest way of getting them off Twitter was to actually go on to Twitter. Um, but hither, before that, and before literally a few weeks ago, I was not on Twitter, I was not on Instagram, I was not on YouTube. I just did not do these things. Um, and I don't think, um, I'm, I think 280 characters is a very bad mechanism for carrying on serious thought. It's a good mechanism for emotional response. Uh, Good is in quotes, obviously. That's a little bit of sarcasm. It is not a mechanism for deep, reflective thought, and it's not a mechanism for really wrestling with the biggest issues and the biggest problems. And I think to the extent that we become uh, hooked on it, as uh, we view this as the peer review mechanism, uh, I think that is uh, false. Uh, what you're going to get is uh, you get very rapid responses, which are not uh, uh, deep 
and not thoughtful. And I do worry about the quality of our uh, ability to carry on subtle and reasoned discussion um, where we make important distinctions, we identify important uh, differences. Uh, you know, is dexamexasone good or bad? Well, it's unlikely to be good or bad. It's likely to be good for some patients and, you know, adverse for other patients or neutral for other patients or a problem if you do it and you avoid other treatments. And I think that is, that kind of subtlety is what science is about. Uh, and uh, it's how we make progress. Uh, and I, I fear in, in the Twitter age, uh, uh, and I'm not like Laura, that it's gonna go away. I don't think it's gonna go away. And I do worry about its undermining uh, the deep thought that has been at the heart of uh, biomedical science. So we have a question about the role of the World Health Organization in all of this. Could they be more proactive in setting standards? Uh, uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Golligly? Um, so I saw the question here on the conversation about can WHO do the reviewing? And I can sort of say, absolutely not. Hmm. Um, most of the major journals are receiving hundreds of papers a day. They are fully employed well over capacity trying to deal with this flood of papers and WHO is not staffed or capacitated to manage that. Of course, individual um, staff members of WHO are approached by reviewers for the, as reviewers for the expertise in their fields and I think most editors will tell you it's very hard to get a response from them because their day jobs are pretty all-consuming. So, um, Ideally, yes, of course, we'd have a massive WHO, but that's, that's unlikely to happen. So no for that. Then on the quality standards, yes, absolutely. We do try to advocate for quality standards and something such as this webinar and this series of webinars is exactly in that vein, as well as, of course, working with the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. And I will take back Professor Emanuel's suggestion that we um, reiterate or make some policy uh, common policy on how we deal with press releases prior to publication or prior to submission even. Um, and then we do are continually involved in trying to improve standards around the review of research and its translation into the guidelines that the government then pick up and actually uh, affect all of your lives, whether that's physical distancing or clinical care or prevention measures, or eventually, you know, vaccines um, in these circumstances. So, yes, if there are other quality uh, issues that are becoming problematic, we really want to know about them and, and want to try and bring people together and solve them. Yeah. Professor Emanuel, do you want to add to that? Concur. Concur. Excellent. I mean, it's basically a, a crazy idea because just think about the vast range that is published in biomedical science. The WHO can't encompass the two or three experts in all of those fields. I mean, it just makes no sense. It, it, it requires the worldwide effort of all the experts. And by the way, all the experts that give their time voluntarily uh, because they somehow know this is really important to progress, even if they can't articulate why they're doing it, except that this is what people who are successful do. Well, there is a reason we all do it. And, and that is because we think having a vetted literature is actually uh, enhances progress intellectually as well as, again, for the benefit of uh, future patients uh, who get treated based upon what we, uh, advance, what we find works. Excellent. So I have a question that sort of speaks to this surgisphere issue about uh, access to data and data sharing and transparency of data collection. Do you have any thoughts about how that uh, situation could have been uh, prevented or managed. Uh, Laura, uh, uh, Dr. Golligly, shall I go to you first? And then everybody, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Professor Emanuel, I can see people want to talk about this one. So uh, I'll go to you first and then to Professor Emanuel. Well, so obviously in hindsight, if something's too good to be true, it probably isn't true. Um, that's all I can say about surgery sphere. Uh, in terms of public availability of data, one of WHO's requirements is that if WHO is making a recommendation, so an explicit formal recommendation to governments in the context of a guideline, the data on which that recommendation are made 
have to be public. So this has led to some disagreements with the European Medical Agency and other bodies, regulatory bodies around the world when they want to be able to take data in confidence and use that to change um, regulatory approval. At WHO, we currently don't accept that. So if we could push that particular standard a little bit more upstream, so if the people asking here are saying, researchers talking to journalists, not necessarily in the context of a press release, but being interviewed, if journalists um, could say, well, I, you know, I can't take your question, I can't have this question answered unless the data are available for scrutiny, perhaps we could get uh, better behavior and better alignment there. Over. Professor Emanuel? <laughs> yeah, I think this issue of sharing data is very important. As a researcher, you go out, you spend a lot of time collecting data, you're going to publish a number of papers uh, with that data, you've scrubbed it, you've uh, uh, spent the effort assembling it, um, and then just to send it to the world is obviously uh, a problem. Uh, there, you know, you want the underlying data, I think uh, uh, we've agreed at some point ought to become public, but uh, uh, you do need to give the research team that spent the effort assembling it because it is a huge amount of effort. It's what takes most of the time uh, um, is th they ought to be recognized for it and other people ought not to be able to take their data and publish until they've, the, the original research team has had time. On the other hand, uh, we do have to have what journals publish, which are the summary tables. Uh, and there is a huge amount of trust, as everyone knows, trust that those summary tables do reflect the underlying uh, data, that the researchers haven't trimmed and, and uh, uh, otherwise manipulated the data to make them look better uh, than they are. Uh, you know, that gets to falsification. Um, and uh, uh, we do end up you know, having trust with other researchers. And I see no way of avoiding that. Uh, if we flood the world with lots and lots of data, you know, no one has the time to, you know, analyze it all and, and to find out whether an article is valid. We're still gonna be ultimately reliant on the process we have, which is peer review. Um, and I should make one other comment, Ross, which I think is, you know, maybe we've lost sight of in this pandemic, right? There was no expertise at the start, right? We had expertise in virology, we had expertise in other coronaviruses, but you know, we ha we've had to build up expertise. We've had expertise in epidemiology. We've had to build up expertise about this particular uh, virus, its characteristics in a pandemic, its clinical characteristics, and it's inevitable we're gonna make mistakes. So we, we have to begin there, but that doesn't mean you can't have more knowledgeable evaluation of the data. And I do think we have to have the underlying data. I mean, the problem with the dexamethasone study is there was no data, there was no table one and two. And we need that kind of stuff along with, you know, at least a summary of the methodology. Um, we can't expect, and I should, I should think we will never get from the general media respect for they, they don't understand the methodology and they don't understand table one and two. So we're not going to get from them, even if they said, well, we need to see the data, you know, put that data, the underlying data in the press release. We're not going to get, that's not a sufficient filtering mechanism to use Lara's term. Uh, uh, you know, that requires knowledge and expertise to know what the right data is that needs to be out there. And that's why I think we really do have to have a stringent standard on press release publication um, and to quash it down because I don't think we're, that's going to be a, a filtering mechanism, even if the general uh, um, uh, journalists from, you know, the major newspapers and, and the economists and others, they just don't, won't have that kind of expertise in uh, that we need. Well, we're running close to time. It's amazing how fast an hour goes by. It feels like we've just barely surfaced the major issues. But there's a large number of comments and questions in both the question and answer and in the chat. Um, uh, I think we'll need to, I think we should have a 
volume two of this uh, uh, webinar because it's such a, I think it's a really profoundly important issue. And we're in this sort of interregnum. We've now got six months experience of the virus. As you say, Professor Emanuel, we're getting some expertise. Now I think we need to actually start to set some policies and procedures. So I saw a question uh, there speaking towards, uh, are the journals together, editors together, getting kind of a playbook uh, on guidelines and guidance? Uh, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, recognizing that, uh, we will save all of the chats and try to respond to them in some way. I'm going to invite each of our speakers, and uh, first I'm going to thank them, but invite them to make some final closing comments on where they see this going in the uh, inter you know, near and intermediate future, and maybe some thoughts for long-term changes. Uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Golagli and then to Professor Emanuel, and then we'll close up. And thanks everyone for coming. It's been a fabulous discussion. Dr. Golagli? Oh, she's been muted, I see. So we'll go to <laughs> Professor Emanuel. No, who's, there oh, there you go. Here. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so so one, that's how we work. We just silence the editors. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> so just to let you know, we prepared completely independently uh, for, oh, this, yeah. for this presentation. And so it's great that we could find so much common ground. Um, and I think that that's what will happen, basically. There, as I said, the entire world is going through this unprecedented event at the same time. So although we say perhaps a few weeks of peer review, you know, people should be prepared to accept that, the clinicians who are seeing the patients, a few weeks is the difference between the rising curve going down again and coming on the other side. And if they have a drug that they think they see working, it's going to be very difficult to quench that enthusiasm or desperation um, the desperate measures of trying to get that out in time. Uh, so I think we need to keep it in mind this is not sort of normal, normal state of play. Um, but with that said, I have every confidence that we will improve our systems and uh, that we'll get better. And the second wave will be brilliantly prepared and uh, ready for the next one. Okay, um, we're gonna we're, we're gonna hold you to that, uh, knowing that physicians <laughs> support therapeutic vacuums. Uh, okay. Professor Emanuel, to you, and then we'll close. Yeah, I do think we need uh, this. Has let's say COVID nineteen has shown uh, cracks in lots of institutional structures and systems, uh, certainly healthcare systems, public health responses. Um, but I think it has shown that we do need to attend. Uh, and reaffirm the underlying values of publication ethics uh, and the underlying purpose by which we have editorial review, peer review, and then publication. And I think getting back to those fundamental uh, values, you know, reliability, uh, the ability to trust what's out there, recognizing it's not going to be perfect. And I think you know, Lara is right. But one of the problems of this pandemic, it seems to me, has been the dramatic increase in uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty of, you know, where it's going to go, where it's going to evolve to, uncertainty of how to manage patients. And I do think one of the main benefits of the biomedical uh, uh, publication process has been to try to increase our level of certainty. And I think, again, to go back to a point I made before, we do have a trade-off and we should be very frank about the trade-off. Rapid publication, decrease in reliability versus slightly slower. And we should emphasize a few weeks is slightly. It's not dramatically um, uh, for an increase and I think a substantial increase in reliability. I, for one, vote for the latter. Let's take a little more time and let's uh, uh, increase dramatically our reliability. Um, I do think there are a number of interests warring against that. The pressure of Twitter, the pressure of the general media, um, and we do rely on two groups uh, to keep it on, or three groups to keep it honest. One is the researchers themselves to stick to tradition because there is value in the tradition. The funders and especially the journal editors, uh, not any individual, and this can only be done if they work collectively. And I would urge them to work collectively to reaffirm the underlying values that they uh, have. Uh, we all benefit from it. And uh, um, thank you for doing your job. And I know it's been stressed beyond belief, like all of our lives have been stressed beyond belief by COVID. 
um, but you have to reaffirm the core uh, and the fundamental. That integrity is something we all rely on. Thank you. So Zeke and Lara, if I may, thank you for spending time with us. This was an hour in my life very well spent. Uh, thank you to the participants for their questions and comments. Greatly appreciated. I know we didn't get to all of them. And thank you to Feprin uh, for organizing this. I hope we can come back to this in six months to see if uh, Lara's prediction of uh, we're doing a better job comes true. Uh, maybe a year. Uh, but anyhow, I wish everyone a good day and to take good care and uh, be well, be safe, and be sane. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.